Uh, I'm just going to go briefly over a very simple um, assessment, what sort of history and examination investigations you might do, which you can get out of a textbook. And then uh, the, the bigger point is to go through some examples of uh, scenarios that you might deal with if you're in an emergency or on the ward doing an after hours shift. So lots of causes of breathlessness. Um, and you've just got to have uh, some way in your mind of thinking through it systematically, whether that's thinking of pulmonary, cardiac, uh, other causes, or by other systems, however we want to do it, but you've got to have some kind of systematic way of thinking about what the problem might be. Um, these are, this is from an emergency textbook and just some of the more common things that uh, you need to have in your mind, um, people presenting to emergency. You've got your airways disease, heart failure, ischemic heart disease, pneumonia, and psychogenic is one of the most common causes. Um, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, and then you've got to think about the life-threatening causes, things like upper airway obstruction, pneumothorax, PE, um, and acute neuromuscular weakness, which is again quite rare can be a problem. So when you're seeing someone, we always say it, the history, if you can get it from them, is really, really important. And if you're going through the history of breathlessness, you want some idea of the duration and onset, because that's going to tell you what the problem is. So you know, typically something like a COPD exacerbation, they'll be grumbling along with symptoms for a few days, but a pneumothorax, they often have sudden onset symptoms associated with pain. Um, so that duration and onset is really important. Uh, position, you know, people talk about orthopnea with heart failure, but anyone who's really breathless and got bad lungs will get more breathless lying down, so it's not that great a distinguishing um, thing to work out. You want to know exacerbating relieving factors and obviously how, how bad it is. Um, it's really important when you see someone to go through a full kind of sieve of other respiratory symptoms and cardiac symptoms as they're really the most common things that you're trying to distinguish between. Um, and they're all fairly straightforward. And when we seeing someone, um, when you're seeing someone in emergency or we're seeing someone in the clinic, we, we want to do a full respiratory evaluation. Um, we want to know their past medical history, obviously, have they had lung problems before? Smoking history and occupational history is really important. Um, family history, uh, you know, things like have they had blood clots in the family? Have they had histories of malignancy within the family? And if you're seeing someone in hospital on the wards, um, it's really important to know if they've had an operation, um, what it might be, because, you know, what it was. Did they need a general anaesthetic? Were there any problems with it? Did they need intensive care admission or intubation? because that predisposes you to a whole other realm of problems like aspiration or ventilator-associated pneumonia or an increased risk of pulmonary embolus. And then other things like vomiting, have they got a risk of aspiration? So when you go to examine someone in either emergency or on the ward, the first thing you want to do, as, as you will when you're answering interview questions for jobs, is go through a danger response, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever it goes down to now. Um, but essentially, you really want to be checking airway, breathing, circulation right at the beginning. It's a really important thing to do is check their respiratory rate and take it yourself. Um, it's, a sign, it's a kind of observation that sometimes seems to be made up or not done properly, and it can tell you a lot. It's one of the highest predictors of a MET call within the next 24 hours is an elevated respiratory rate. Um, and it's, that's because it can be elevated for all sorts of reasons, pain, acidosis, hypoxia, uh, anxiety. So uh, it's an important thing to check. You want to know their oxygen saturations and how much oxygen they're on. Um, if you get to see, call to see someone on high flow oxygen, you need to know what FiO2 they're on. And um, the nurses should be able to tell you. There's a little, the machines that they're on should be able to tell you as well, but that's really important because someone who's saturating on 94% with a FiO2 of 28% is obviously someone different is, is on 100% oxygen or 60% oxygen. Uh, you want to make an assessment of are they in respiratory distress, checking their accessory muscle use, do they look sick? 
Um, and then a comment on their body habitus is often useful as well. Uh, again, you know, this is all kind of textbook stuff in terms of what you, what you should do to do a thorough respiratory uh, examination and um, try and do it. Uh, when we're talking about investigations, I mean, it really obviously depends on the situation. Um, anyone who's significantly hypoxic or got a history of airways disease should have an arterial blood gas. Um, I think anyone who's significantly breathless should probably have an ECG. Um, blood investigations are important. You want to make sure they're not very anemic. If the renal function's okay um, and some other routine bloods, in certain circumstances, we might use CRPs, procalcitonins, troponins, BNPs, or D-dimers. Chest X-ray is also very useful um, and, and really important, particularly for a first episode of breathlessness. Spirometry can be very useful, uh, not always. Uh, and then in other situations, we'll do testing for microorganisms or further imaging with CT or VQ scans. Any questions about just the basic evaluation? Is all med student stuff? Yes? Uh, they're not so useful uh, usually. So they're only usually that useful if uh, we're suspecting resistant organism like Pseudomonas. Um, and they don't often, often they're done, often they won't change our management even if there's a positive thing. Yeah. I can, I'll get into some more specifics as we go through the cases. Uh, so this is Mr. MD. Um, he's 65. He lives with his wife. He's got a past history of um, possible ischemic heart disease, although that's not really established, type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Uh, you're the um, EDJ moan, you've been asked to see him. Uh, he comes in with increasing breathlessness and now he's getting breathless at rest. What do you want to know? Yes. Okay, so for the purposes of this, I'll be Mr. MD. Um, I won't be posturing or anything, but. Um, uh, so I've been feeling more breathless for the past few days. It's kind of just been gradually getting worse. And now I'm having trouble sleeping. I haven't had any interest. Yes, I'm currently smoking. Oh, sorry. Uh, I've got about 100 pack a year history of smoking. Uh, it's not worse at night, um, but I just this got so bad in the last day that I can't really sleep at night because I'm feeling breathless. Never had anything like this before. Yeah, coughing up some yellow sputum. Um, anything else you want to know about the cough? Uh, no blood? Very good. Someone's doing a respiratory term. Um, I uh, usually have a cough, but usually it's white and it's changed in the last week. Uh, I've got a little bit of swelling in my legs uh, and I feel a bit wheezy. Never had blood clots. No recent travel. Uh, yeah, it's been on and off again for a couple of years. Yep, uh, I've got grandkids who've been a bit unwell with it too. No? no? All right, so what has Mr. MD got? Uh, yes, he could have. What else could he have? Could have pneumonia? PE? Yes. Could have a lung cancer, yeah. We didn't ask about weight loss, that'd be another good question. We didn't ask about fevers, you know, we could have got more of a history of a kind of infection. Maybe could he have heart failure? Yes. So a history, you know, we could go a little bit more in the history to try and distinguish those sort of things, but, um, and we've got a kind of a working diagnosis 
and then we'll do some investigations. So are you in emergency what investigations will you order? Well, actually, you're going to examine it first, aren't you? Sorry. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. I don't know if I put an examination here. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. Um, the um, so how would you assess them? So you would what would you do? For, what would you order in emergency? So you've done an examination. You, how would you assess him? You, you'd assess his airway, breathing, circulation, etc. Um, and you do a respiratory examination. So if I told you he's saturating at eighty-eight percent on room air, um, he's tachypneic. His respiratory rate is twenty-six. Um, He's a bit tachycardic, his heart rate's 105, his blood pressure's okay, he's afebrile. Um, on auscultation, you hear occasional crackles, but mainly a wheeze. Um, he's got normal heart sounds. He's got a little bit of um, some mild pitting edema. Um, anything else you want to know from the examination? Calves are not tender now. JVP is uh, not elevated. That was on room air. Okay, what invest investigations would you do? Good. Uh, what does it show? Yep, why does it show hyperinflation? Yeah, so the diaphragms are really flat and you can actually see it a bit better on the lateral really flat diaphragm, it's supposed to be a dome, um, but this is very flat. On the PA, sometimes you get this picture a bit when people have got very flat and hemidiaphragms that you don't get a crisp outline of the, of the diaphragm. Um, and if you count all the ribs, there'd be too many, too many ribs. Anything else? Yeah, so yeah, important negatives. So no cardiomegaly. Uh, is there any obvious consolidation? Nothing really convincing for me. Uh, doesn't look like there's heart failure. Again, these um, on the PA, it's a bit hard to tell whether there are fusions or not down here. The hemidiaphragms are a bit flattened. But on the lateral, it doesn't look like there's a fusion, so it's probably not. So they're hyperinflated. Um, you've done an ECG. So sinus rhythm, any ischemic changes? No, anything else worrying? No, good. Um, because you're very good, you've done some spirometry. Um, and the spirometry shows an FEV1 of FVC of 45%. What does that mean? Obstruction. Good. Uh, so you've got obstructive spirometry, and the FEV1 is 40% predicted, which means it's a severe obstruction. And you've done this blood gas. What does the blood gas show? Spiritual acidosis. Do we think it's acute or chronic? Why do you say chronic? Yeah, so I guess the bicarb is up a little bit, which shows there's a degree of chronicity or, or um, renal compensation. But the fact that they're acidotic means there's certainly an acute component. So I would call this an acute um, respiratory acidosis with perhaps some degree of compensation. So on the basis of that, all that, what do we think he's got? Yes, I think we, we, we can say he's got an exacerbation of COPD. Um, he's probably got a few infective features, so we could go into that. Um, and um, yeah, so he's got a hypercapnic respiratory failure due to an exacerbation of COPD. We've proven COPD. He's got obstructed lung, obstructive lung function. He's got a big risk factor for COPD. He's got a 100-pack year history of smoking. 
He's got a, C, a chest X-ray which is hyperinflated, which shows it's probably been a problem for a while. So um, the diagnosis of an exacerbation of COPD is a bit nebulous. It's a change in their respiratory status from baseline um, over and above their day-to-day -day variability. So that's a mouthful of a kind of definition. But um, he's obviously very sick and we don't have any other clear cause for his deterioration. So he's in, we, we're saying he's got an exacerbation of COPD. How would we manage him? Okay, so oxygen, what would you be, what oxygen level would you like him to have? Yeah. And what, you've got to have it clear in your mind what saturation you actually got. Yeah. So um, if we if people, particularly who are CO2 retainers, we are quite comfortable aiming at 88 to 92 percent with people who've got established COPD. If someone is 26 and they've got a SATs of 92 percent, that's really abnormal and that's important to remember. But someone with a long smoking history with clear evidence of COPD, you are happy 88 to 92. Anything else we give him? Steroids. Steroids, yes. So um, give him 50 milligrams of prednisone. Uh, I give it to him for five days. Um, and then I'd stop it. It's a routine thing. Um, you can give IV hydrocortisone sometimes, but I'd only do it if they can't swallow or they're vomiting lots and you're worried that it's not going to go in. Steroids, maybe some oxygen, bronchodilators, so we give him uh, Ventolin and Atrovent. Anything else? Antibiotics, if we think there's an infection, um, yes, we give them oral antibiotics. If we think there's a pneumonia and they're very sick, we give them intravenous antibiotics. What antibiotic do I give everyone in the oral? I usually give augmented. Anything else? We give them oxygen, steroids, bronchiolitis, antibiotics. Bypass? Yeah, so BiPAP, the indications for BiPAP are for acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. So, um, but usually you'd give them a little bit of initial treatment and then you reassess. So you give him probably three lots of Ventolin and Atrovent and have some steroids. Um, if he's kind of stable, you might do a gas in an hour's time. And if he's looking okay, you go from there. If it was still acidotic and hypercapnic, you'd start BiPAP. All right. And then... Um, the other thing we would give is DVT prophylaxis for everyone on the ward. Um, when we're giving Ventolin, so usually um, bronchodilators, we usually give around five milligrams of salbutamol every four hours if someone's quite sick, and Atrovent 500 micrograms every six hours. Um, we try and give MDI and spacer rather than nebulizers as much as we can, particularly in flu season. Um, if someone comes in with a respiratory virus and you're giving a nebulizer, you can spread it around a bit. So. Um, try and try not to nebulize too much. Um, I won't hound you on spirometry at the moment, but it is a really important skill. Um, the to do adequate spirometry, someone needs to be seated, and they need to be able to breathe out for at least six seconds, and they need to have three efforts which look about the same before you can really believe it. There's lots of ways that you can do it badly. And so if you're interpreting spirometry, you need to see the flow volume curve just to work out whether they've done it properly or not. Um, let's get through all of that. All right, so Mr. MD um, came in with his exacerbation of COPD. He actually got a bit of BiPAP. Um, he recovered pretty well and went home. And a year later, comes into emergency and presents with another infectious exacerbation of COPD. He's still smoking. Um, he's admitted again, he gets five days of prednisone, some bronchodilators and, and um, antibiotics, and you've been called to see him on the ward because he's now got severe breathlessness and left-sided chest pain. Um, should be a couple of things going through your mind as you're walking to see him. What, what things are we thinking about? Pneumothorax? 
PE, yeah, uh, and ischemic event. They were the three things that I'd be, I guess, worried about if someone's been doing all right and then they've had a sudden deterioration. Um, so he's very tachycneic this time. He's needing a lot of oxygen. Um, his heart rate is tachycardic um, and he's in a lot of distress. So we'd obviously do an examination. Um, it can be quite hard to get a, a real good assessment of breath sounds and things like that when people are this sick. Um, but you do your best and you'd order a very urgent x-ray on the ward and it might look like this. What to show? I hear a pneumothorax? Yes. This is not Mr. MD, but one of our patients on the ward at the moment. Um, so you can see, I removed the arrows from the uh, x-ray, just so <laughs> you couldn't cheat. But um, this is the lung edge here, and so you can see he's got a right-sided pneumothorax. Anything else about this x-ray which is unexpected from the clinical scenario? He's tubed, yeah, well done. Uh, so he's got an ET tube in there and a tracheal tube. Um, there's perhaps some shifting of the mediastinum uh, this way. The diaphragm's not flattened, but given his clinical scenario, you'd be worrying about attention. So what are you going to do? Yes, correct answer. <laughs> Get help, yes. Then what might you do? When there's 20 other METS calls going on in the hospital at the same time. Decompress it? Yeah, so how are you going to do that? Okay, can you put a chest rate in? No. So if you're, so literally if you're there and no one else can help you, what are you going to do? Yeah, so there should be no scenario where you actually have to do this in the hospital. Um, but uh, if someone has attention in the it's a life-threatening scenario, you know, you might be on a plane or something and have to deal with this. Um, and so you want to go, uh, cross your fingers, you're not. But um, the, what you need to do is decompress it if they're really acutely deteriorating. And so you want to go, uh, oops, it was on the right side, mid-clavicular line, you want to go uh, second intercostal space, and you can actually just put a needle in, and then that should decompress it. Uh, the definitive management will be a chest train. Um, and, um, you know, when this guy had a met call on the ward, yep. Any needle. Yeah, put a cannula. Cannula's good. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I guess the advantage of putting a cannula, if you've got a cannula, is that you can put the cannula in and then take the metal bit out, so you're leaving the plastic in, so you're not causing more damage. But if you're in that sort of situation, that's not really what you're worried about. Um, if you think he's, they're far too obese to get it in, there are longer needles. So um, there are thoracocentesis kits, um, uh, and, and you'd have to try and find one of those. Um, so this guy came into emergency, he had a chest train put in in emergency, he went to the ward, uh, the pneumothorax resolved, the chest train was taken out, two days later it happened again. Um, and on the MET call, apparently the anaesthetic registry compressed it, so they actually put a needle in, I don't know exactly what sort of needle they put in, uh, and then he went to ICU and had a chest train put in. Yeah. Um, So pneumothoraces can be primary or secondary. Primary if they've got no underlying lung disease, secondary if they do. Um, often it's chest pain and breathlessness. Uh, examination, you can have a hyper-resonant percussion note, although that's a bit of a subtle sign. Breast sounds reduced on that side, tracheal deviation away from and reduced chest expansion. The real one you're looking for there is breast sounds reduced or absent. How we diagnose it, we look for it on a chest x-ray. For small ones, we can get them to do inspiratory and expiratory films, and sometimes that helps. 
Um, CT chest is sometimes often very useful. Sometimes we have people with really bad emphysema, lots of bullae, and it's quite hard to tell whether there's a pneumothorax there or not. And in that setting, chest X-ray or actually chest, sorry, CT chest or ultrasound can be quite useful. Um, there's lots of different ways of telling how big a pneumothorax is, but actually probably more important is the degree of clinical compromise. And so if you're in uh, America, you me uh, measure the size from the apex. Um, and if you're in Britain, you measure it at the hilum on the side. And I guess we get to decide whatever we want to do here. I've never seen anyone use the light index. Um, and essentially, we, we're dividing into small or large pneumothoraces. So for my mind, uh, you're looking for the lung edge, you're trying to work out whether it's greater or less than two centimetres at the level of the hilum. Um, and our options for management depend a little bit on whether it's primary or secondary pneumothorax and how symptomatic they are. Um, this is a bit messy, but um, essentially, if it's a primary pneumothorax and it's very small uh, and they're not too symptomatic, you might actually just send them home and review it again in a few weeks' time with an X-ray. Um, but, but if it's larger, you might aspirate with a needle um, rather than putting a chest strain in, and if that can sometimes works. But if they're still symptomatic or it doesn't work, you put a chest strain in. Um, if it's a secondary pneumothorax, they've got underlying lung disease, uh, you're much more likely to need to be putting a chest tube in. Um, and this is from the British um, guidelines. All right, so he survived again. He comes in. Yes. Yes. Uh, I've not heard it turning into attention, but if you're aspirating, you obviously want to uh, aspirate to the point where you're not getting much air back and then do an x-ray. Um, and if, they're, if it's resolved, it's resolved. If you follow them up quite closely, you might do another x-ray four hours later just to see that it's still okay. Um, uh, but if it hasn't, then you'd be wanting to put a chest tube in. When I say chest tube, I'm always talking small bore chest tubes as well um, with a selding a technique, not the big um, ones, cardiothoracic ones. Any other questions about the pneumothorax? Um, Mr. And he comes back a year later with breathlessness and wheeze, still smoking. Uh, you do all the things you've done before, and this is his x-ray. Probably not his x-ray, but uh, what are you thinking about if you see that? Heart failure, yep. Yeah. Why? Yeah. <laughs> He's got bilateral um, infiltrates, doesn't he? They're probably lines more than nodules. Um, you look out here nice and closely to see if you can see some curly B lines. There might be some flat horizontal lines there. I don't know how well it projects. The heart looks big. Um, there might be an effusion on the left side. Uh, so it's all looking pretty good for pulmonary edema. This is the ECG now. Different from his old one. What's different? E wave inversion, anything else? Uh, borderline, yeah, anything else? Is there ST elevation? Maybe. There's certainly massive Q waves inferiorly, which um, weren't there before. And so he probably has had an infarct, but might, not necessarily at the moment. Maybe it's happened a little bit of time ago. That was his old one. Um, okay, so if we're managing pulmonary edema, um, so people come in with breathlessness again, often a cough, sometimes they can even have some hemoptysis. Uh, you think about orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, edema. Uh, examination, we're looking for um, same sort of things, tachycardia, cyanosis, elevated JVP, peripheral edema, third heart sound uh, can be quite useful if you can hear it. Uh, Bivasal crackles and wheeze is sometimes part of it. <clears throat> Um, in terms of treatment, so I guess the, another thing to think about is uh, you obviously want to know whether they've got a cardiac history and if they're coming with pulmonary edema, you want to know why they're having the edema. Um, 
Have they, have they had lots of fluid after an operation? Have they had a new cardiac event? Uh, have they become suddenly anemic and decompensated because of that? Are they having ongoing ischemia? Um, the other thing is people can have, obviously, diastolic heart failure or heart value with reserved ejection fraction. It's really quite common. Um, and so sometimes an echo will look okay, but they can still have heart failure. Uh, so in terms of treatment, positioning can be quite important. Sit them up, uh, give them oxygen, uh, IV frizomide, and usually you know, you start with 40 milligrams IV if their blood pressure is okay. Um, if they're on long-term Lasix, you might need to give a higher dose. <clears throat> if they're not responding, then you go to the next level and you guys will be needing assistance if that gets to that point. But you're looking at things like GTN infusion. Uh, you can use CPAP or BiPAP if they're hypercapnic, inotropes, and in some circumstances you can even use morphine, although the evidence is not great for that. Um, usually be managed in CCU. You'd want to obviously get a good uh, fluid balance chart. I would usually get a catheter in so you can monitor their outputs. Any questions about that? No? Cardiology is easy. Um, all right, someone else. Mr. RFP72, he's got a history of mild COPD, hypertension, high cholesterol, chronic kidney disease, type 2 diabetes, and presents to emergency with breathlessness and cough. Um, you do an examination, you don't find too much. Um, you're waiting for his blood, his x ray comes back, it looks like this. What do we think? So it's, an ab it's abnormal, yes? Uh, yeah, it might be a bit rotated, so um, might be part of it. Cardiomegaly is borderline. Yes, we know he's got the right upper lobe consolidation. Yes, good. So, um, how do we know it's the right upper lobe? Okay, that's partly correct. Um, yeah, so, if, if you're looking at a um, AP or PA X-ray. The right upper lobe is there, the right middle lobe is there, and the lower, right lower lobe is there at the back. Um, so it can be quite hard to tell which lobe something is in. Um, we want to look at landmarks. So um, if the right heart border is lost, then it's more likely to be the right middle lobe. If the diaphragm is lost, it's more likely to be the lower lobe. Uh, we look for the horizontal fissure, which is what this thing is. Um, and so if it's above the horizontal fissure, it's probably going to be the right upper loop, an, outli uh, an outlining like that. Uh, to confirm, we want to have a look at the lateral. And it's a bit hard to tell on this lateral, but you're looking for the oblique fissure, which probably runs up along there. So lower lobe's behind. And then that's probably the horizontal fissure. So middle lobe would be there. And then this is upper lobe. So we know it's an upper lobe, we then need to work out what it is. Um, is it consolidation? We'd like to see bronchograms, and it's a bit hard to see bronchograms on that. Um, although, you know, sometimes it can be tricky. We want to know the outline, and up here the outline's not that clearly defined. It doesn't look like a mass so much, um, although I guess that's still in differential. Um, but if uh, we think that he's had a cough and he's actually febrile and got high inflammatory markers, we're going to say this is a community-acquired pneumonia. Um, so routine tests, we do a full blood count. We, we do all the bloods we talked about. We, we sometimes do the pneumococcal and Legionella urinary antigens. Um, the, they're just good for rationalising antibiotics, basically. If you get pneumococcus, you can be very sure that penicillin is the right thing to be giving them. And I, we rarely actually do atypical serology because the results aren't going to come back for a couple of weeks and won't change your immediate management. Um, if you want to know about treatment of pneumonia, the therapeutic guidelines is pretty good. Uh, it's got a nice straightforward um, uh, algorithm in it. 
important things to work out is whether someone needs to come as an inpatient or outpatient. Obviously, if they're hemodynamically unstable or needing oxygen, they need to come in. Uh, other things that can help you are scoring systems. So there's one called the Pneumonia Severity Index, which was in the kind of Australian one. There's one called the Smart Cop. There's another one called Curb 65. So lots of different scoring systems that you could use. Uh, and then depending on the severity, you use different antibiotics. But the, I guess the, the important thing is that most people will benefit from a penicillin and then something to cover atypical pneumonias. Um, usually, well, in the past, that's always been a macrolide and the most evidence is probably for a macrolide, but our therapy guidelines actually have doxycycline there as the first uh, line. I'm not quite sure why, uh, but either uh, doxycycline or rulite is, is kind of what we'd use usually. So four days later, Mr. RF was getting better, um, but now he feels a lot worse with right side pleuritic chest pain and fevers. He'd been asked to see him again after hours. What are we thinking of now? He could have a paranemonic effusion. Anything, if we're worried about an effusion, what are we kind of worried about in that situation? An empyema, yeah. So um, lots of people who have a pneumonia have a parent pneumonic confusion, and that often will just go away with treatment. Uh, an empyema is a lot more severe and is defined by either having pus in it or a positive culture. Anything else it could be? Could be a PE, yeah. Uh, and again, unlikely ischemic event, but that's another thing to think about. Uh, what about this x-ray? Yes? So the problem, let's go to basics. Problems on the right, yes? yes. It's too white, yes. Um, and then we've got to work out from there. Does it look like a mass? No. Does it look like lung collapse? No. Does it look like an effusion? Kind of. Um, so normally effusion, you'd expect to have a fluid level and a meniscus sign, but a loculated effusion, uh, an empyem, which you can see in an empyema, you can often be loculated like this. So yeah, this guy's got an empyema. So, He's probably got some lung collapse as well. So it's, it's been pulled up. There might be some collapse around the effusion, um, and that's probably what's going on. So um, I guess there's a list of things to think about when someone's got a pneumonia and they're not getting better. Um, it could be because the, the antibiotics aren't working because the organism is resistant, or it's an unusual organism like Pseudomonas, or uncommon like TB or something like that. Could be complications of the pneumonia, so empyema or an abscess, um, or it might not have been a pneumonia to start off with, so a PE or a malignancy are, are kind of the two more common things. Um, organising pneumonia or other inflammatory things is what we think about. All right, I think this is the last one. So Mrs. GA, she's 88 uh, from home. Uh, she's got mild dementia, some ischemic heart disease, heart failure, COPD, hypertension, AF and she comes into ED with confusion and abdominal pain and presumed to be secondary to a UTI. Uh, she's given some antibiotics and she's on the Jerry's ward and you're asked to see her because her respiratory rate's 22. Um, what, any thoughts? Lots of risk factors for heart and lung problems, doesn't she? She could be any of those. Sepsis, yeah. Kind of fluid overload, lot, you know, the differential is really, really wide, isn't it? So she's alert, disorientated, she's very tachypneic, um, she's a little bit hypoxic, uh, tachycardic, uh, she looks very unwell, um, uh, tummy's a little bit tender. What tests would we do? Do a lactate, what are you looking for? So ischemic gut, yeah. 
sensors. Yep. So we're going to do uh, two blood gas, maybe an abdominal ultrasound. Chest X-ray, thank you. ECG, yes. Blood tests. Yep, good. So this was her blood gas. This is arterial. What does it show? Metabolic acidosis. And what do you want to know? Yes, lactate's eight or 10 or something. So um, she's got ischemic gut. She's got AF, she wasn't anticoagulated, and she's got ischemic gut. So um, just remember uh, you know, the other causes of breathlessness um, and respiratory distress, particularly metabolic acidosis. Um, pain and anxiety are also quite common ones. Um, so Mrs. GA has now spent two weeks in hospital and she's awaiting a rehab bed. Uh, she reports vague left-sided chest pain and increasing breathlessness. She's now quite hypoxic. She's still tachypneic. Um, uh, she's still a bit tachycardic, although she was better in between time. Uh, clear chest, clear chest x-ray. You've done very well, done another blood gas. You got it first time. Um, and it shows some hypoxia. Uh, ECG shows a sinus tachycardia and she's got a mildly elevated troponin. What should we do next? You can get a CTPA. Would you like to do anything first? Please don't do a D-dharma. <laughs> What's that? No. Uh, don't worry about a well score either. It's not validated in hospital patients. Uh, no, but what do you need to know before you do a CTPA? Don't do a leaky scan. Kidney function, yes. So just talk, thinking practicalities. So, um, uh, you, so VQ, I'll talk about VQ scans. So VQ scans can be quite useful, um, but in a lot of situations, they're not useful. So if someone's got underlying lung disease or an abnormal chest X-ray, they're really not useful. Um, oftentimes, they don't give you a definitive result. Um, a CTPA will tell you whether there's a clot or not, but if it doesn't tell you that, it will tell you what else is going on in the lungs. So if their renal function's normal, please get a CTPA. Um, there are concerns about radiation, obviously. Um, the modern scanners, the radiation is much reduced compared to previously. And I think, um, I'll, I'll discuss it with patients, but I would always advocate for a CTPA over a VQ in most circumstances. Um, so she went on to have a CTPA, and there's just a couple of cuts here which show filling defects, big one, um, near the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery. Um, so she's got a big PE. So um, if you're evaluating for PE, you've got to think about risk factors. Um, the acquired ones are far more common than the, and important than the hereditary ones. Um, people often are breathless. Sometimes they get some pain. Sometimes they get some cough or hemoptysis. Um, tachypnea is probably the most common sign, followed by uh, tachycardia. Sometimes they have some written rails in this series, which is I guess, an undefined abnormal breast sound, but um, often their examination is quite normal. Um, if you do a blood gas, sometimes you'll found, find a respiratory alkalosis or hypoxia, but not always. Uh, commonly, you get a sinus tachycardia on the ECG, but again, not always. Um, you read of this thing called S1Q3T3, uh, which is an ECG finding that you can get in PE, and you know you see that maybe once every two years. Um, you look for markers of right heart strain because that predicts how their outcomes from PE. Uh, and troponin can be helpful for that. And some places will use the BNP. Chest X-ray is really important to exclude other things. Um, and then you've got to work out what test to do. So in emergency, um, a D-dimer can be really useful and you use the Wells score. Um, so use a well score to put them into either low or high risk of clot. If they're high risk, the D-dimer doesn't matter. You need to do a scan. If they're low risk, you do a D-dimer 
and if the DDAR was negative, you stopped it. If the DDAR was positive, you would do a further investigation. Um, DDAR is not great. They can be positive for lots of other reasons. Um, there's another score called the PERC uh, score. I don't know if you guys have heard that. It's, a PE rule, it's kind of a PE rule out criteria, which is used in ED as well. And essentially, if someone's really young and they're not hypoxic or tachycardic, they've got no risk factors, um, that's kind of a score you can use and you might not do even a D-dime. Um, we do run into problems with people coming in, um, and particularly young people sometimes with a bit of non-defined breathlessness who are not particularly hypoxic or tachycardic, and sometimes they'll just get a VQ scan, not even a D-dime. And the VQ scan can be positive, and if someone has a positive, has a PE with no clear precipitant, you know, they might need to be on lifelong anticoagulation. So it's a really important decision to make when you're making that diagnosis. So you, you, it's really important to go through the algorithms when you're in ED, do the well score, do a D-dimer if it's indicated, and then try and do a CTPA rather than a VQ until the nuclear position gets in there. Um, Good, so just if we're thinking about important differentials, um, someone's breathless, particularly in inpatients, if you're after hours, think about PEs, think about hospital acquired pneumonias, aspiration events, uh, flare ups of airways disease, um, pulmonary edema, ischemic heart disease, pneumothorax, anaphylaxis reaction to antibiotics and things. I haven't talked about post op atelectasis, which is actually really important. So. If someone has an operation, particularly if they're under GA or have an abdominal operation, they will invariably get some atelectasis, and often they're a bit hypoxic um, after an operation. It's the most common cause of post-op hypoxia. You can get some minor changes on the chest X-ray, uh, and it can be hard sometimes to differentiate between um, atelectasis and the pneumonia. Um, but we I've, usually try and treat for pneumonia only if there's good signs of infection like fever and inflammatory markers, because often it will just get better. Any questions about any of that? Good, so yeah, so just make sure you take a history when you can, do a systemic evaluation and good examination, use the tests a bit judiciously, but chest X-ray you almost always need, and arterial blood gas is very useful. Thanks.